Thank you for joining us. The session is entitled, I'm Confused. Why more data collection? What is the value in collecting and sharing usable patient reported data on the patient's terms? Uh, I think this title gets the award for the longest, or at least of any session I've emceed. Um, I am really pleased to welcome Megan O'Boyle as our speaker. She is the patient engagement lead at Rare X. She is the mother of a 20 year old who has Phelan McDermid syndrome, which is a rare disorder. She is also the principal and of the Phelan McDermott International Registry. So she's very qualified to talk to us about this burning issue of data collection, something all of us parents with children of rare disorders have faced. Um, she believes that patients belong at the center of decisions about patient sharing and collecting of data. And uh, without further ado, I am going to turn the program over to Megan so she can tell you more about this. And at the end, we will take questions in the chat. So just type your question in. I will read the question and Megan will answer it to the best of her ability. And um, I also have on the um, uh, list of participants, if you wanna raise your hand and verbally ask your question. Okay, so um, Megan, welcome. Hello, everybody. I, I am so excited to be here at part of this amazing conference. Uh, and I want to thank Marianne for the, the introduction and the NBIA Disorders Association for inviting me here to share a little bit about um, data collection with you today. So just a brief overview of what we're, I'm going to try and cover in the next half hour or so is some information about RareX, who we are and what we're trying to do. Um, and what the uh, experience would be for um, the patients entering data in RareX. Um, we're going to cover something called governance, which is um, essentially how data is collected, kept confidential, and um, private and shared. Um, I also will explain the um, benefits of RareX to patient organizations, such as your uh, various organizations and NBIA um, Disorders Association but also uh, the benefits to the families and the patients um, and uh, how this data is different um, and complementary to other data that you may have already contributed to another study. So the RareX mission um, is really to speed up treatment for rare diseases by removing the barriers. And um, this, these are removing barriers to access to data and the analysis of it. Um, we want to help accelerate the diagnosis of disease and the understanding and really hope to get to more drug development. So what is RareX? Um, we're new and we're a nonprofit and we have um, huge goals. And uh, as a nonprofit, we're funded by grants and um, philanthropy. And we were created to accelerate rare disease research, treatments and cures by again, removing those barriers, which I will explain next. Um, RareX is a platform that collects and, and connects and shares data, um, but we don't own it and we do not sell it to anybody, pharmaceutical companies or, or anyone else. Um, and we don't do research with the data. Um, we make it accessible for those who want to do research. Um, and finally, RareX has the benefit of being um, powered by the technology of the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, this is a partnership between Harvard and MIT. Um, and we have the benefit of over $70 million of their investment in developing this technology. So I spoke about barriers. Um, there's several different barriers to data collection and use in rare disease. Um, and these can you know, uh, really slow down the progress of drug development. So the first is that data exists, um, but it's captive in what people refer to as silos. So it may have been collected by a certain university or a certain institution, um, and it's being studied by um, the people in that place, but it's not made accessible to um, other researchers um, or organizations. Um, and that really limits the use of it. It, it means that if that uh, entity loses funding or loses interest or the um, 
person of, that's doing the work uh, moves on to a, another disease or another institution that the data um, collection may st you know, stop. Um, the other barrier is that data um, is being collected, but it's not structured and standardized. Um, and it, when it's not structured and standardized, it's very difficult for researchers and communities to use. Um, so people are giving their data, but not in a way that is um, valuable. Um, and finally, um, some data just simply doesn't exist. Um, it's really expensive and it's a lot of logistical work for organizations um, to do data collection. And it involves a lot of um, uh, technology and uh, ethics and security and um, policies and procedures. So um, it's really a daunting task for organizations that are busy raising money and providing support to also get in the business of data collection. So why am I here today? Well, um, a few months ago, RareX was approached by um, one of the organizations supporting the um, BPAN community. And so uh, um, we'll be launching a BPAN data collection program soon. Stay tuned, you'll hear more about this. Um, and all of the BPAN organizations around the world will be supported through this. Um, and all the BPAN families will be um, able to access it. Um, but uh, the BPAN community uh, introduced me to the NBIA Disorders um, uh, Association and said that you know, maybe there's other organizations that would like to, to be collecting data from patients and um, families. So I'm here today just to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and let you know that if you're interested to learn more, please reach out to me. Um, just to set this up, what it would feel like um, for, for an organization that is part of RareX, um, somewhere on their website, um, maybe under the research tab or something, there would be a, um, some information about why is patient and family reported data important. And if you wanna learn more, click here. And from there, you would um, go to this uh, first blue box, which we call a community page, um, which uh, will have more information about what the, the reason to, to contribute data the benefits to you and how to get started. And then like anything else that you do on the internet, you set up a, an account and a password. Um, and then the first two um, things that you go through is the informed consent, which you've all done in hospitals and other surveys um, where it's explained what you're doing and, and um, all the rights that you have around it. And then something that makes RareX very unique is our data sharing preference survey. And I'll get into that more later. Um, but this is where each participant really gets to decide who sees their data. And I don't mean like who in terms of a specific person, I mean what types of researchers they are comfortable having access to their data. Um, personally, I want, um, as a parent of a child with a rare disease, I want all the researchers to have access to my data. But there are some people that um, have more concerns and, and want a more limited um, sharing decision. Um, and then on the far right, you'll see a list of all sorts of different types of, of what we call domains or symptoms. Um, and for uh, each domain or symptom, there may be a, a survey. Um, to begin with, we are collecting um, very simple um, general medical information on um, just what parts of the body uh, the patient has symptoms in. And then um, as time goes on, if you say yes to a symptom, then there may be another survey um, with more questions about that one symptom. So this is a busy slide, but I will um, uh, try to walk you through it. Um, if you see along the top, um, you'll see these, these um, kind of pink people. And right here is uh, BPAN. So um, they are one of 10 groups that are ready to go live um, on RareX um, in the next month. And so uh, they will, you know, patients and families will establish accounts and then they will answer these uh, in the blue section, these first four surveys. Um, and as I said, over time, we'll be adding other surveys um, as we um, develop them or can um, actually identify the best existing surveys that, that are out there. On the bottom, you'll see in the green boxes, um, different types of researchers, um, researchers from institutions and um, medical facilities and 
biopharma and biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies that are developing drugs and, and devices. Um, and they can access this data through a researcher portal. Um, and they can search for data when they do a query. Um, they don't have to do it disease by disease. Um, they could do a query based on symptoms in which they would get people from all sorts of diseases that have the same symptom. Um, which also means that a researcher may come across um, data on your patient with this rare disease and it's something they've never ever heard of, which means you've just exposed a researcher that's never heard of your disease to your disease and they may take interest in it. Um, I had two slides back, I had said that you go from your website to a community page. This is just an example of the current BPAN community page. Um, if I were to scroll down, you would see all the different logos from the various communities, um, BPAN communities around the world. And um, for those people who haven't seen this, <laughs> this um, presentation, it would give them um, some information about what the um, importance of this data collection is and, and why they should do it. Once they hit this um, red get started button, that will take them directly to the um, data collection platform and they'll start answering questions. So um, when I was working with the Phelan McDermott syndrome, um, uh, the disease that my daughter has, uh, I helped start their registry. And everybody told us to collect data, FDA, Global Genes, Genetic Alliance, the researchers, but they didn't tell us how, they didn't tell us where, they didn't give us the money to do it. And nobody mentioned something called governance. And um, it's very important and uh, groups, uh, it can, be, it can be a lot of work. Um, so RareX is taking on all of the governance for all of the diseases they collect data for, which means that we are taking the um, legal, ethical, and responsibility for how the data is collected and how it is stored and how it is shared. Um, this includes that data sharing I was talking about, um, the informed consent forms, um, what, how the uh, data is de-identified, and at the bottom, you'll see um, country by country regulations and compliance. And this refers to things that some of you may have heard of in Europe, GDPR, um, which are the rules that certain countries um, have around data collection. And all of that is done by RareX. So why do communities like BPAN or any one of you um, may want to, to get to partner with RareX? Um, well, for one, there's no cost to the organizations or the patients, which allows the organizations who would normally be spending money on collecting data um, to spend it on something else in research or support. Um, the uh, Rare Access is collecting what I referred to earlier, structured and standardized um, data, which means that the organizations aren't bringing us their uh, questions and answers. We are providing the best questions and answers um, for them in their um, symptom areas. Um, this data is patient owned and managed. Um, the ownership means that it's, it's that you put it in, you can take it out and you decide who gets to see it. Um, and the management is done through that data sharing preference. Um, typically, um, in many cases, as in my daughter's own disease, the, the data collection or registry is um, managed by the uh, actual foundations. Um, as I said in the previous slide, the governance is handled, which is a huge um, burden that organizations don't have to worry about. Um, and getting the data to researchers is um, streamlined. Um, there's something called federated data access that RareX does, which means that uh, researchers come to that, query, that, that portal to query, as I said, um, and they can access data across all different types of data sources, as well as um, uh, data uh, criteria. And this is very different than the one-off. Generally, a researcher will come to a data collection and ask for data, and then they use it. And then another researcher will ask. And, and, and organizations are burdened with the process of deciding who can have the data and whether they're, they're worthy of it. Um, also, RareX is here to, to provide patient support um, for both the patients who are participating or the organizations that are helping out in these communities, um, not just now, before launch, but during and after. Um, 
we want all of the organizations to have success in getting as many of their patients enrolled as possible. So, you know, we try and um, lend a hand in that in any way we can. Um, and of course, patients are interested in research being faster and being able to connect to other data sources. Um, so what's in it for you? What's in it for the patient or the family? I mean, I, I'm so tired of taking surveys. I think COVID did us all in. Um, so, you know, there has to be a reason that you're going to give up a lunch or give up a shower to, to do what seems like yet another survey that you may never get results from. Well, for starters, you will see the results from this. Um, you'll, uh, both the users, the patients and families, as well as the organizations will have access to what we call aggregated data, which means that you won't see whose data you're looking at, but you will see summaries of data, like how many people have enrolled, how many people who have enrolled have seizures, for instance. Um, and in the rare disease area where some of us don't know anybody in person outside of Facebook, um, our doctors don't know anybody with our diseases, um, it's really comforting to be able to look at the data and say, oh, 70% of the people with this disease are, are having the same challenges that we are. Um, the other thing that is really beneficial is that um, when these queries are done by researchers, they may, they may identify a list of patients that they want to do additional studies on and even clinical drug trials on. And um, they will never get anybody's um, uh, identifying information, they will contact RareX and RareX will contact those families and say, there's somebody interested in, in this particular patient for a study. Um, so uh, by, by being part of, of, of RareX, you find out about things that you're, you are eligible for. Um, and uh, I, I highlighted here more eyes on data. This is really going back to this federated um, model where researchers are accessing and looking into different data sets, not just what we're collecting, but data sets that exist in other universities and other places around the world already about a disease. Um, and this way of querying data without knowing a disease um, really brings more eyes to the data. Um, the other thing is when you're doing a data sharing preference survey, uh, one of the questions is, would you like your name and email um, connected with a, the patient support organizations in this disease. Um, and this is really important because there may be a, a study in the United States, but the person answering the questions may live in Spain. And wouldn't it be great if they could connect with any support organizations in Spain so that they you know, have local support? Uh, there's also the ability to update your symptoms. Um, and this is really important because if you answer a survey this year and your family member does not have uh, seizures, but next year uh, they've had two seizures and the following year they've had uh, you know, five seizures a month. That shows the progression of the disease over time. Um, it's actually what a natural history study is, is seeing the progression of disease over time. So being able to go in annually or whenever something changes and, and update your symptoms um, is really important. Uh, as I said, full ownership and management of the data, and um, again, to speed up um, drug development. So as the title of this session indicated, how is this data collection different from data that you've already been contributing you know, for years? Um, well, it's not specific to any one institution. So again, accessible to researchers around the world. And when I say researchers, that, that includes researchers at um, biotechs and pharmaceutical companies. Um, the ability to do the cross disease research, which I've described, um, the ability to return aggregated data to the community, that's that you know, summarized data that I was talking about. Um, and uh, the fact that this will complement other studies. This is, this is data that a patient or family member would know, not necessarily a clinician. Um, and often clinicians are asking us questions and we are providing the data. So that's still pretty much provided by us. Um, but here in RareX, uh, it's, we're asking you uh, as the source. Um, and also again, the, update, the ability to update the data over time showing progression of disease. 
So I've mentioned the data sharing survey several times. I just wanted to give you an idea of why there is a, an option. So you as the patient are able to manage who sees your data by answering these questions. And the first question is, what type of researcher would you want to share your data with? And we've circled the very first choice, which is general researchers, which would include any type of research. The second choice below it, where it says health, medical, and biomedical researchers, would be a more narrow choice and certainly something that anybody could choose. There's actually a even more narrow choice that you can um, ignore or you can choose, which is only non-commercial purposes, which would, would leave out drug companies um, or only um, research that has been approved by a IRB, which means that the researcher that's coming in to look for the data has submitted their idea and it's been ethically approved. So, this is just a, a, a view of a dashboard. Um, and you know, here it shows that the first line is that you've completed the consent and you've completed the data sharing, um, but haven't started what we call the general information, you know, demographics and things like that. Um, as time goes on and you get more surveys as your symptoms may change, this dashboard will change. So um, if two patients with the same disease have different symptoms, then their dashboards would be different because if I didn't have seizures, I would not see an epilepsy survey. Um, but if I did have sleep issues, I would see a sleep survey. So I know I covered a lot. Um, I think always think the Q&A part is the most interesting. So at this time, um, if uh, however you all want to handle questions, I'd be happy to, to help out. Thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate it and um, enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks, Megan. That was uh, a lot of information and it was all good. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I, I just had a, a few questions. You mentioned a couple of times that participating in this would speed up drug discovery or drug treatments for an individual's um, disorder. How so? I don't want to overpromise and say that we'll all have treatments for our kids, you know, in the next ten years. But um, I will tell you um, a little background. I um, my daughter's twenty when I when she was diagnosed at six months. I was all about her, and uh, I would attend family conferences like this. But I didn't volunteer. I didn't, you know, I was never a founder. And um, and when I went to conferences like this, I skipped the research parts because to me, it wasn't gonna happen in our lifetime and it was overwhelming and I really never liked science. Um, in 2010, when our foundation asked me to help with data collection, um, I was resistant because again, I didn't think research was happening very fast. I can tell you in the last 11 years, the research in um, my daughter's disease, but also in many diseases, um, have started moving faster than I ever would have imagined. Never fast enough for any of us as family members, um, but you know, there's there's just been a lot of breakthroughs, especially in genetics, and um, getting the data, whether it's the genetic data and or the phenotypic data, the symptom data, in the hands of as many researchers as possible, is um, allowing for more analysis and and like I said, more eyes on the data, um, and when. Uh, and if and when a drug company, whether it's a big biopharma or a small biotech, becomes interested in a specific disease or a type of disease. For instance, my daughter has a genetic cause of autism, and maybe there's a treatment out there. You know, she's there's a drug trial coming out that's both Fallon McDermott syndrome, um, Angelman, and Rett. So those are three different diseases genetically, but but in terms of symptoms, they're very similar. And in order for drug companies to you know, set up a clinical trial, they want data. They want to know where the families are, how many there are, um, and, you know, how many have seizures or how many have, have whatever. And um, I've, I've especially found that, that the genetics of each patient are very important to the researchers. So, you know, the way things, it will speed things up is, I consider um, having this data readily available is like growing low hanging fruit. Um, you know, researchers are constantly out there trying to get um, grants for um, 
research. And if they know that your organization is, you know, has all their ducks in a row and they have their, you know, data all lined up, um, then that's going to save them time and money and make your disease more attractive for research. Makes sense. Um, we've got a question asking you to please share, and I know you mentioned this, how this uh, rare RX is, a rare X, I'm sorry, is complementary to current registries and how they can connect to rare X. This is really important. Um, no one research project is going to be the magic bullet for, for any disease. And there are certain things that only medical records can provide. There are certain things that only clinicians that see the patient in person, touch them, talk to them, measure them, do labs, that only they can provide. And there are other things that patients and family members can provide that nobody ever asks them about. So there aren't, there, there are things that may never have been studied because nobody bothered to ask. Um, and so it, it's complimentary in that if you can connect the data on one patient from the, those three sources or other sources, there's, you know, people have wearables, people have apps, there's all sorts of things out there. Biosamples are another huge resource. Um, the more, data you can get on a patient, the more robust characterization of a patient, the better. Now, the problem with a lot of existing data and a lot of data to, um, ex collected in academia is they're not allowed to have identified data. They're not allowed to see identified data. They're not allowed to share identified data. So that makes all of the patients anonymous. Um, in RareX, we are collecting identified data. Um, and so we know who all the patients are. We certainly don't share anything that's identified with researchers or industry without the consent of the families or patients. Um, so it's complementary in that if RareX is collecting data on a disease and knows that you know, 20, 20 of those patients were involved in a study somewhere else, RareX will reach out to the owner of that data and say, how can we collaborate? Is there, is there data that, that we may have in RareX that you didn't collect? Um, you know, if, if we're only connecting de-identified data, you know, we collect certain de demographics and so do you, there's a way to know that it's the same patient but not know who the patient is and so on. So RareX is really trying to be disruptive in the research community in that we want to connect data. We're not trying to stay blind, um, but we're doing it in a, in a safe and confidential way. Sorry, that was a very long answer to, you need lots of sources of data to get to the right place. Are there any risks to families uh, for participating and providing full access to the data at RareX? Um, so, and, and this is why informed consents are so long because the, the, the organizations that oversee the ethics of, of research and confirm that our con informed consent is acceptable um, want us to explain every risk under the sun. And Netflix and Walgreens and all the other places that have our data do that also, but we don't read those informed consents. We just, we just hit agree and download whatever it is that we're got, getting. Um, in, in medical and health data, you, you, know, you have to be very explicit and, and um, very transparent, and that's what we are. Um, and so, yes, the risks of giving your data to Starbucks or your doctor or anywhere else is that data can be hacked. Um, but we are, you know, complying with all of the safety measure, measures and um, requirements that are required of, of health data. Um, the other risk, so there were two categories, all researchers or just medical biomedical health researchers, which is typically who's going to be interested in our data. So let's say there's somebody that's doing a study on um, ethnicity and depression or um, gender and sleep patterns or something like that. So there may be data that is analyzed that is not for the purposes of medical and biomedical. It may be more based on um, ethnicity, gender, race. Um, so in that case, you would want to click this, the second option. Well, okay, so speaking of the form, if somebody picks, this is a question from a participant, a general choice I'm sharing, 
um, uh, can they say that they would want the researchers to have an IRB first? That's yes. So the first, review board? definitely. The first question is pick one or the other, but you have to pick one because basically you have to say, I'm letting researchers have this. The second um, page of choices, you don't have to pick any. You can pick one or you can pick both. You pick both, that's as narrow as you can get. Um, but, you know, in, in Philip McDermott syndrome, currently we, we only release data to, to researchers that have IRBs. So it's a perfectly, um, you know, uh, acceptable practice. Um, the other thing is, this is purposely not in the consent. You cannot consent somebody, you cannot change their consent. So the reason the data sharing agreement is outside of the consent is, I may not be comfortable sharing my data with anybody right now. And I may think pharmaceutical companies and drug companies are the devil incarnate. So I may say, everybody but, but drug companies can have my data. I may find out six months later from Facebook that there's a great study going on with a biotech and my child might benefit from it. And I may wanna go back and check the box that, yeah, I am interested in having commercial access to my data. So um, it's very important that people are able to make that change in, in how they feel about data sharing. Another question from a participant is, what is needed for other NBIA disorders to have a presence on RareX? Um, for you to understand more about RareX in detail, so you can set up, um, just reach out to me. Um, I'll put my email in the uh, chat. It's Megan O at RareX. And um, I will give a presentation similar to this, but, but able to answer specific questions you have. Uh, as I said, there's no cost. If there's more than one organization in, in that disease, I, RareX wants to, to talk to all the organizations that may be interested um, because this is disease organization agnostic. It's not about any one organization. It's about the disease community across the world. Um, although RareX is um, planning to have uh, all 9,000 diseases available, you know, um, that need, not everybody needs data collection. Some people already have a good collection, but um, we have started in the neuro area. So neurodevelopmental disorders is, is where our first 10 early adopters being launched next month will be. And we will continue with mostly neuro diseases. Um, as we bring on new surveys, for instance, about vision or hearing or um, muscular is issues, then we'll open it up to diseases that have those symptoms. We just don't want to bring people on and say, oh, and we don't have anything that's relevant to your patient. Um, so any, I believe anybody in the NBA world would qualify as early adopters. Would they be able to uh, add questions on the surveys that the families take that are specific to the disorder? No, but I would ask what would be something that was specific to the disorder? Um, and you might say, well, our patients have epilepsy. Well, thousands of rare diseases have epilepsy, or at least several hundred. Um, sleep issues are very common. GI issues are common. What's very unique in my daughter's disease is lymphedema, swelling of the, the arms and legs. That's not typical in genetic causes of autism. But lymphedema is not rare in diseases. It's just rare in diseases that she looks like. So there's not likely a symptom that's truly unique to a disease. It's just in a different domain or symptom survey. Um, there are questions though that we will not likely ask because there are questions that drug developers and regulators like FDA and EMA are not interested in. And the best example I can give you is one of our early adopters said, we wanna know when their, when everybody's kids were toilet trained. And I said, so did our community, but drug developers don't. And, and the more questions we add, the more burden it is to the person answering the questions and the less likely it is that they will come back again. And, they, and we want them to come back every year. So there are some questions that are better asked within the community, either in a survey monkey or a Facebook poll or even getting like a postdoc to do a survey. Um, so we are very upfront about we can't be all things to all people. Um, that said, sometimes a, 
um, pharmaceutical company or biotech may come to Rare X and say, we're developing a drug for this disease. And we really need specific information on these things. And Rare X would say, great, we'll make sure these are good questions and answers through our standards program. We will have our technology program put these in for this disease. And you will pay for that to accelerate that. So the pharmaceutical company would, would pay for that. But the data would not be exclusively made available to that pharmaceutical company because we don't sell data. Um, and more than likely, if it was a great survey, we would say, and we're gonna add this to our collection of surveys. So the answer is there are situations where specific questions or surveys will, will be added, but in the context of that question, I would say we would advise that the um, organizations do their own data collection in a um, different way. And we will help with like, is it something you need an IRB for or is it something you can do on Facebook? I'm just curious, how, how do you support the organization? Where does your revenue come from? So as with all nonprofits, like all of you all know, you go after grants, you go after sponsors and you go after philanthropic um, donors. And so that's what we do. Um, interestingly, um, we keep talking about pharmaceutical and biotech. They want RareX to be successful. They don't want to be in the business of having to collect data on each and every disease that they're working with. And they also don't like working with patient organizations. They're afraid of getting in trouble with regulators. So they would prefer to keep their distance. So, you know, they, they want good data collected that they can use, that FDA will find valuable and allowable to use. FDA is very picky about where did the data come from? Who touched it? You know, where was it? Um, so they've been very supportive of this effort. Um, and also pharmaceutical companies are so tired of groups like mine saying, we have 10 years of data. And they take a look at it and they say, most of it's not really useful or valuable because it wasn't standardized or it wasn't structured or the parent really wasn't capable of answering this type of question. So um, it's a combination of different kinds of fundings. Including from pharmaceutical companies as well. Absolutely. Um, we have a question about how, how you are safeguarding the data. And I know you mentioned that, but security is such a huge issue in the cyber world. Do you have some kind of extra protection because of the type of information that you have? Uh, Absolutely. Rarex? So RareX is a nonprofit that is, is managing all of this. Um, as I said, we don't own the data, we don't sell the data, and we don't research, do analysis. We are powered by the technology built by um, the Broad Institute, B-R-O-A-D, out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they are also a nonprofit, um, very well funded through philanthropy. And they are a combination of efforts by MIT, and which is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Harvard. They have been in the business of doing research and um, genetic uh, sequencing for years. And in order to get the funding that they've had to get from NIH and other um, funders, they have had to reach meet the highest um, compliance for data security, confidentiality, and privacy. And so um, they, they cover all of that. Um, they also cover, you know, there, there's two sides to compliance for GDPR. There's the data processors, which would be um, the Broad Institute, and the, there's the data controllers, which would be RareX. And um, that's why in, in the governance side, it says we're doing data regulation country by country. Um, although GDPR is a blanket regulation for Europe, every country in Europe reads it differently and has different requirements. So before we go translating into any, any other languages, we will make sure that languages in which those, the countries in which that language is spoken, that we have complied with the requirements of that country. I've got two last questions because we've got about three minutes left here. Okay. Um, the same questioner who asked about the cybersecurity of your site also asked, what are the risks of engaging researchers who don't have an IRB? Um, 
The risk is that you don't know what they're studying because they haven't had to state it. The upside is um, when you're talking about metadata, like we're talking about data across lots of different diseases coming from several different places. If you go in as a researcher that knows a disease, you go in with kind of a hypothesis in mind. If you're, if you're a data analyst, if you're a math major undergrad somewhere, or you are a you know, PhD who just data analysis is your thing, you may know nothing about the diseases, but, but you may um, have a, come, come up with a novel hypothesis that people that are more familiar with it have, would not. So um, the downside is you, you don't know how the data is going to be, um, what it's going to be used for. And the upside would be that um, there's some brilliant people out there that are uncovering things just by doing the analysis. And then our last question, um, can you speak a little more about how Rare X came to creating the survey questions? For example, like who provided input for those survey sure. questions? So we don't um, want to create surveys because for the most part, there's too many out there already. Um, so we have a standards program, just like we have a governance program. Um, and the standards team has data scientists and um, they use survey methodologists. But, you know, for instance, if, if we're doing um, epilepsy, so first they would do a landscape and find all the epilepsy surveys that exist by pa for patients, for family members, and most of them are going to be by clinicians, which are not well worded. <laughs> um, they will do uh, get key opinion leaders from NINDS and NIMH and various other places, but they will also get key opinion le leaders from industry, people that would be using the data. Um, so they would have epileptologists from around the world and they narrowed down the surveys and questions and answers that are applicable. And then they have the data scientists and data methodologists look at them and say, does this question and answer yield the data that is actually needed? Um, because I will tell you from experience, questions and answers can look great and logical, but not yield the data that is needed. So it's, it's a very um, time consuming and costly process, which is why we are not coming out with all the surveys on the entire body at once. It's, it's gonna come in, in waves. I'm afraid we're gonna have to end it there. Um, I can't thank you enough, Marianne. Hey, I can't thank you enough. Um, Great presentation. Could you please put your contact information into the chat? Sure. And I just want to say to the 18 people that showed up, thank you, because I never would have shown up for something like this on a Saturday 20 well, years ago. It shows how important data collection is. And behind those 18 people are often others, family members, et cetera, who are participating in this. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you for taking time out on your Saturday to be with us.